Good morning, it's Tuesday Morning Live here on the Slanted Lens. So welcome to a live show here on Tuesday. It's 8 a.m. on the uh, West Coast. All those beach blanket uh, bonfire folks of LA are just crawling out of bed, reaching for that cup of coffee. Meanwhile, back in New York, everyone's looking at the clock going, is it time for lunch yet? So somewhere in the middle, everyone else exists. And we hope you'll enjoy our show this morning. We got a lot of fun things to talk about. I am really excited about cameras as always. But there seems to be this battle that's been going on now for a long time between Sony, between Canon. Fuji takes a punch in there every so often. Panasonic swings occasionally. I mean, there's a lot of fun things going on in that whole market. And of course, there's some new announcements and some things to talk about. But in that kind of view, as we cue that up, I'm just thinking about these camera companies going back and forth. And of course, I shoot on both of them. I have both Sony and I have Canon. I shoot on multiple cameras. Uh, I'm pretty invested in both those markets, so I think I've got a pretty neutral point of view about those cameras. But of course, the uh, announcement that came just yesterday or day before, well, it's been a couple of days now, are the new EOS R3 mirrorless camera. We all knew the R3 was coming. It's an interesting camera. It has a great look. It's really funny to me, though. It's a full-frame stack sensor. It has eye control autofocus, which is really interesting in that where you look is what focuses. So if you're ADD like me and you go, oh, squirrel, you've got a problem because that squirrel just got in focus. So that I'm really interesting to, interested to see how that is going to work. Is it really as effective as you would want it to be, as you would hope it to be? Uh, I'm, to, I'm excited to be able to test that and just see exactly how that eye autofocus works. It does have, it says subject tracking with deep learning, 30 frames per second. When we get into this category of 30 frame per, frames per second, we're really talking about an A9 uh, a kind of competition here between Canon and Sony. It's more of a sports camera. Uh, it's going to be a camera that's really more in that category. This is my favorite though. Positioned squarely between the R5 and the US 1DX Mark III. What? Positioned right between a cheetah and a mammoth. Cheetah's running wild on the plains and the mammoth is frozen in Siberia. I'm not so sure how that <laughs> I'm going, okay, I love the 1D Mark, uh, Mark 1D, 1DX Mark I. It was an incredible camera, but it's a hybrid kind of mirrorless DSLR. I mean, I don't know how that, I mean, the body looks like a 1DX uh, Mark III. It has that ba battery grip on the bottom, which gives you a long battery life. It's that larger kind of sport format that they've made in the past. So I think it certainly falls in that category. But I, I just don't see the comparison anymore. Uh, and anyway, I think the uh, EOS R, or the, uh, yeah, the EOS R5 is an incredible camera. Has a, I think it's probably one of the best still cameras that has ever been made. Uh, but um, it's certainly a, well, we're gonna talk a little bit more that, about that as we go. So anyway, the, the R3, incredible camera. It does do 4K video. In my mind, unless it does 4K internal raw, 4, 10 bit 422, then I just, I'm not so sure that it's a video camera that's going to make a lot of sense. Uh, but I, it's in that cam category. It's got log 3. We want S log. Absolutely. Uh, we really want to be able to shoot on log with that camera. So it has all the makings of a great camera. It's, like I say, it has that battery grip. It's got the E19 battery, which is a longer life battery. It gives you a lot of strength. It's going to carry yourself a long ways. So, how does that in the ecosystem of Canon. You've got the R5, you've got the R6, now you've got the R3. I mean, really, the R5 is a high-end still camera, wants to be a high-end video camera. Every And of course, that's one of the things here we have here as well, is they have a new firmware update coming out for the R5 that's supposed to do a lot of things for that R5 to make it even more competitive in that video market, but <clears throat> still has some things that it falls a little bit short in. So, in that ecosystem, I really think the R3 matches up pretty much with the, uh, with the 9, the A9. It's kind of in that world. If you're a sports shooter, if you want to have a longer battery life, uh, it's really not a camera you're going to choose to use video, to shoot video. It's really not the world that you're going to live in there. So let's talk about the R5 really quick, and then we're going to talk about Sony. How does Sony hit back with all of that? Uh, that's really interesting. Actually, we'll go to that here next. I mean, the Sony just announced yesterday, rumors are out, that there is an A7 IV. That makes perfect sense. The a7 IV is really a camera. The a7 III needed to be updated. When it came out, it was like the basic video camera. This is the camera that is just been, has just been released, and it was, but they called it your basic 
uh, mirrorless camera, which set all kinds of heights and standards for the entire, entire mirrorless program, the entire mirrorless market, as far as what you had to compete with megapixels and video capabilities all those kinds of things but now the r4 is is coming it's going to come out sometime in october later this year they are saying the price range is going to be about twenty five hundred dollars which is a little higher than what we have right now uh, if we do have questions coming in please send your questions in jelena will interrupt me and throw those questions in as they uh come up on screen so and we'll oh these are rumors yes these are rumors these are about the r4 are rumors but they make a lot of sense because really with Canon's R6, the R6 has taken a huge blow uh, to the Sony line of cameras because the R6 has become a very, it's a favorite camera for people who want to shoot weddings. It's just a great camera to use. Uh, excellent megapixels. I mean, everything about the R6 has become a price point and a camera that works for a lot of working wedding photographers, a lot of beginning photographers who want to step into more of a professional camera. I mean, it really has become the camera. It took on the R3. Now, the thought of having an R4 really takes a swing back at uh, Canon, and I think it's going to help Sony to jump back into that world and that market once again, because that's what the R3 was in the beginning. Or not the R3, the um, A7 A7IV was in the beginning. A7 III was in the beginning. The A7 III was a workhorse wedding camera. It was a great camera in that market. So if it's going to compete with the R6, it's, we really need to have an update. And the, R, uh, the uh, A7 IV is that update. I'm getting all my R's and 4's all mixed up here this morning. So it is rumored to be coming out uh, later this year. Uh, it's, it's really is going to be competitive with the R6. There's no question about that. I mean, a 30 megapixel sensor, which I think is super important. It needs 30 megapixels. I think we've got a, a 24 megapixels, 20 megapixels, that whole range in there. Most cameras are going to step up into the 30 megapixel range because even wedding photographers are making large prints or doing uh, work with these cameras that really demands a little higher, a little larger file size. And I think that's going to be a great, uh, really an excellent point for it to be. It may even be as, I don't know, they're saying 30 to 36. These are all just rumors. Uh, you're going to have a decent viewfinder with this camera. It's not going to be your best uh, viewfinder. Uh, hopefully, it'll have an, ar you know, an articulated screen so that you'll be able to articulate that screen, and that's going to make it much more valuable. Um, I hope it doesn't have the Sony bend-up screen in the back. Oh, my word. That just, uh, just does not work for so many applications, especially if you do video and you're trying to shove that camera in the corner, you're trying to get in a tight spot. That screen in the back is, is just a little bit convenient when you look down. Okay, enough about that. But doesn't really become super, super uh, workable. Okay. Um, it's got to shoot. It's got to shoot 4K. Uh, it, and it's got to shoot 60p at least. Um, nowadays, though, it's interesting with all the speed ramping and the work that people do in video, you, most people are just dying for 120 frames a second. That's where a lot of people who shoot video want to be. Uh, it just gives you that ability to do that slow motion and speed ramp. It's just an excellent look. It's kind of a, a trend that's been going for quite a while now. So hopefully they'll fall somewhere in that world. You know, the question is, what, uh, what lenses do I prefer for video, RF or E-mount? You know, on, obviously, when we are shooting Canon, which right now we're on a C200, is live this morning, that C200 has got EF mount, and or we do the R lenses. And if we're on, we have an R, I was going to buy the R5. I wanted to buy, the, in fact, I did buy the R5, sent it back because of the old overheating issues. And so I... I am going to move all of my equipment into that R lens uh, series of lenses. But in saying that, I absolutely love uh, the lenses that we have for the Sony. Um, it's really that line of Tamron lenses, which are that E-mount lenses, those small compact, all, the, all of your internal kinds of uh, uh, autofocus, all those kinds of things are inside the camera, setting those all in the menu, and it just makes that lens small, compact, and easy to travel with. There's some great things coming out from that uh, that we'll talk about here in one second. So, so in saying that, I, for video, I think they both work in different ways. What's coming out next from Tamron, which is super exciting, is they're doing. They're going to remake their 28 to 75. That 28 to 75 now is going to be completely programmable. You can plug that into the computer, and you can say, you know what, I want the ring in the front to be my telephoto. Uh, change my uh, telephoto. I want the ring in the back to be my focus. Or you can switch them. I want my focus to focus like Nikon and go this way, or I want my focus to go like Canon and go the other way. So you'll have the ability to completely control 
uh, those new E uh, series lenses from, um, from Tamron. And of course, Sony makes incredible, the G Master series are incredible lenses, uh, sharp, easy to use, and, but if I had to choose between the G Master and the R lenses, I'd probably be going with the R lenses. I think R lenses right now are incredibly sharp and incredibly good. It's a great series. Well, not to be outdone in that whole world of trying to keep up and to try to stay in there is the R5 gets a new release. I wish this release would go like this. New release for the R5. We solved the overheating problem and you can shoot video now. But no, it's got a lot of other things. But really the big noteworthy item there is that it will now give you an 8K uh, export to the Ninja V+. Plus. And the Ninja V+, Plus is just coming out. It's about $1,500, $1,600 and it allows you to record 8K video on the Ninja, uh, Ninja 5 Plus, which is pretty incredible. You now have the ability to capture 8K video. You do have to buy an external recording device, the Atmos, uh, uh, nin uh, oh my word, the Atmos uh, Ninja 5, but it gives you the ability to do 8K. And why do you want 8K? Everyone goes, what's the purpose of 8K? Why do you care about 8K? The only reason I care about 8K is because if I'm going to shoot and post in 4K, I can set a single camera and that single camera in 8K allows me to punch in and out on an interview. It allows me to, to do motion tracking in the frame because I can, I can take an 8K video and I can now move in and I can do kind of movement inside that video and that gives you a lot of options in editing and just makes it really easy for interviews and things to really give you really interesting shots and looks later in post without having to set up two or three cameras, without having to set up a lot of uh, motion equipment. It's just a quick, easy movement, interest kind of gathering uh, process. So that's why I think 8K is really important. So that is the one thing that I think is incredible. I wish this just said it, that it gave you a, a 4K, no overheating, uh, not the line skip 4K, but your high, high quality 4K out of the R5. Uh, I would own that camera right now if I felt confident in that. Um, but, you know, in this entire process, in this entire process of Canon versus Sony, you got the A1, which I've shot on, and I love the A1. I really do. It is an incredible camera. The autofocus is incredible. The frame, the megapixel, everything about that camera is very, very exciting to me. But way in the distance, like a lone rider in a bad western, rides the... R1. The R1. I'm waiting to hear and see exactly what the R1 is going to be because in that, that process, that decision for me is probably going to be the key decision on which one of the Canon, Canon cameras I buy next. Um, am I going to be on a C300 Mark III which has got a crop sensor like the R, like the uh, 70, 70, uh, 70 C, C70 or am I going to go into a heavier camera like the 500 with a, a full frame? I'm just waiting for the R1. I want to know exactly. I've read rumors and spec rumors, but it's still a ways out there. So I feel like Canon has not played their final card, you know, and they are keep teasing with these updates and things that they're doing that are kind of helping us to, to see that they have something and they're still staying in the market. Uh, Sony's kind of laid their cards on the table with the... Uh, a1, but of course those cards always get trumped by something else. So they'll have other cameras coming, but I just really interested in that R1 and what's going to happen there because that's going to be a, a deciding factor for me. Asking about, what about Fuji? What about Fuji? What about Fuji? Funny you should ask. I, there's two announcements from Fuji just recently that I absolutely loved. And of course the one here, and I'm going to look it up here, is the Fuji 500. I hear my cat on the roof are three cats on the roof. <laughs> Who has three cats? I don't want to talk about it. Okay, uh, where's my stuff here? So first we have the Fujifilm X-T32. X-T32 Fuji, uh, this is a great entry-level APS-C sensor camera. It's an incredible camera. It's that swing that uh, Fuji has been swinging in this market for a long time. If you want an APS-C sensor camera and you're happy with that, that uh, place in the market, I think Fuji makes an incredible camera. It has a great picture, beautiful imagery, uh, easy to use. It's that old style where you have all the dials for your, your shutter, your aperture. It gives you complete control of all of those, uh, all of those things. So I think that uh, X-T32 is a great step up. 
Interesting to say though, it's basically a firmware step up. There's not a lot that has changed in that camera. It's not, the sensor has not changed. Um, your camera body has not really changed. It's basically a firmware. So you're kind of asking your, your fan base to say, okay, sell your X-T30 and buy the X-T32 um, for a firmware update. Now you may think, all right, it's a higher resolution LCD screen. That's one thing. So that, that is, I mean, that's significant. Um, it gives you better video modes. Um, there's two extra film simulators. There's two extra film simulations. Okay, yeah. But we got that. You know, we got improved autofocus mode, which is really good. That's I mean, there are things about this here that are really worth it. If I had an X-T30, would I buy the X-T32? Hmm, yeah, I don't think so. You're gonna get the same beautiful image. If I had not bought yet a APS-C sensor, I would buy the X-T32. There's no, there's no doubt about it. It's gonna be a great camera. Uh, I have students, and I would suggest this uh, camera to students who are looking for a first camera to really get out there and work with. And so I love that X-T32. And Tamron has just announced that they are going to be making lenses in this Fuji mount. So you're gonna have those to be able to call upon as well. So it gives you a really cost-effective, excellent lens at a very sharp and a great, uh, great price point. So the next one, I think, I think if I were shooting medium format, I'd have the GFX 100S2, uh, GFX 100S. I love that camera. It is a huge uh, megapixel, medium format, significant camera. But of course, Fujifilm just announced their GFX 50S 2. So it's a 51.4 megapixel uh, camera. It's $4,000, which you may say, well, that's a ton of money. It is a ton of money. But for a medium format, that's an incredible price point. It really is an incredible price point. It's going to be some, uh, available sometimes late in uh, and, uh, October. It's got all this, the same film simulations. It's got the uh, really the great autofocus. And that is the one thing that Fujifilm, the GFX uh, 50, the GFX 100, had really good autofocus in comparison to, say, the Hasselblad, which wasn't near as good in the autofocus category. In some ways, I love the Hasselblad. Uh, X1D, I like the, uh, the picture better. But I, Fujifilm is not far behind. Uh, I would love to have that uh, GFX 100S. is just an incredible camera. But if you can't afford that and it's a couple of thousand dollars more, I would go with this GFX 50S. If you're a landscape shooter, that's a beautiful image. You're going to get incredible images. You can stitch those into two, and that's going to give you a huge file. It's going to make for a beautiful camera to be able to carry with you and do landscapes. A great place to get into the market. It does do video. It does pixel shifting. Uh, it's just a, a lot of things about this new series from Fujifilm, this medium format series, that make them excellent cameras. They've gotten smaller, more compact, uh, more user friendly, and that really makes it uh, important. There's five axis in body stabilization. Uh, it gives you like 6.5 uh, stops of variable uh, ver uh, vibration reduction. You know, as you look back to the, uh, the S, it has 12 stops, of, as, I, as I recall. It has 12 stops of, uh, no, no, eight stops of IS. So it, that's really significant. You know, it's funny though, I talk to people all the time and I'll watch other YouTubers go, yeah, you know, this is how to get stable images, you know, and shoot it, you know, twice the, the aperture, or twice the, uh, the uh, telephoto of your lens. And I'm going, no, no, shoot at a 60th or faster if you're hand holding uh, or put your, your camera on a tripod. Yeah, novel thought nowadays. People are scared to death to carry a piece of equipment. Carry a tripod. Put your camera on a tripod if you're going to be under 60 to a second. I don't know anybody who shoots landscape photography who wants beautiful, stable, sharp images that doesn't put their camera on a tripod all of the time. So even though it gives you that performance, I'm not so sure that it's uh, the most important uh, thing that we take advantage of that. So question, is Nikon going down? Is Nikon going down? Nikon's going down like the Titanic taking on water. Nikon is going down. No, I don't think Nikon's going down. It's interesting because someone made a comment in one of our videos and they said, Nikon is a hidden gem and until you use it, you don't realize just how amazing it is. And that is true. I've shot on the, uh, the 850 and I love that camera. I love the picture. I love the quality of the imagery. Uh, we've shot on their cameras, most all of them, and they give you a beautiful image. Um, some of the features, video features, have always been a little bit behind 
and but have become much better in recent years and so I don't think Nikon is out of the picture at all. I view this like this and I, I think this is probably the way I would suggest it to anyone who's in any of these uh, kind of lines of cameras. We're in both Sony and Canon so we have lenses in both Sony and Canon. We've got Tamron lenses for Canon, we have Tamron lenses for for Sony, we have all of those but uh, if you are not in one of those lines, then you pick a line and start buying lenses and stick in the lens line that you've created. You know, the bodies will change, they'll update, they'll get better, but, and the lenses will update as they go as well. But generally speaking, you can shoot on a lens for a long, long time. Um, yeah, you really can. So if you're into Nikon, you bought the glass, then stick with Nikon because it's, you're going to be happy with it in the long run. Unless you have some application, professional application that just makes it so you want to get into a certain area. But look at how that flips back and forth. The X-T3 was an incredible Fuji camera that did a 10-bit 422 Kodak internal recording. You know, and at that moment, everyone's going, buy that one. Then it was the Panasonic. Get the Panasonic. Then get the, you know, it's just, you can, you know, flip-flop uh, back and forth like a fish on the deck of a boat. You know, so I just would, I would find the camera line that you like, you enjoy using, you understand the menus, you understand how they work, buy lenses in that camera line, and then move full speed ahead. Just stick with it. So DSLR, is, DSLR is dead. Our DSLR is dead. <laughs> like the 1DX Mark II, frozen in Siberia. <laughs> Yeah, I think DSLRs are pretty much done. And there'll be some companies out there that are going to continue to make DSLRs just because it'll be an inexpensive price point where they can get people into the market quite uh, inexpensively. Uh, Canon will probably always have some DSLRs. The Rebel line's always been extremely uh, popular for them, will continue to be a great line of cameras, I think, for a while. But the reality is that all of their research, all of the, the really new innovation, all the autofocus, all those kinds of things are all going to be coming out in the mirrorless cameras that each one of these uh, camera lines are going to really push forward with their research. The R&D is going to really determine that direction. So DSLRs, and there's, no one's going to invest in the DSLR kind of innovation anymore because the market's moved past it. And why has that happened? They're just smaller, they're lighter weight, they give you better video capabilities. They're just things about them that just make them so much better to adapt to the future. And so that's definitely the direction. Mirrorless is the direction. DSLRs are kind of at the end. All right. So what about conferences? Are people really still doing that? Conferences. Oh, wow. So interesting. This is a whole nother, whole nother world. We went to WPPI. Um, WPPI, we used to go to WPPI when there was like 18, 20,000 people going. Of course, the pandemic hit. It was already sliding before the pandemic hit. And then the pandemic hit and we went to the, of course, everything got canceled in 2020. And of course, the conference we went to this year was later in the year. And there was, I think, about 4,000 people. And these numbers are just off the top of my head and, and rumors around the floor. So there's nothing official about these rumors. But around 4,000 people scheduled, about 28 to 3,000 people, uh, 4,000 people registered, 28 to 3,000 people actually picked up their badges. And so you had a very small conference. And you could tell that on the floor, Sony wasn't there. You know, uh, Nikon was not there. Uh, it was Canon, uh, Tamron, Sigma. I mean, some of the, those were there, but it was a very small trade show. And you could tell how bad it was because at one point, in the U shape of all of the booths, there was a huge area where they're playing, I think it's cornhole, where you throw the bean bag. There's a big old, there's a big old area to play games in the back. And that's because they couldn't even fill up, and they'd brought the curtains uh, forward, they couldn't even fill up a third of the floor, or two thirds of the floor at the, at the uh, exhibition. So, so yeah, I think conferences are really hurting right now. I think there's gonna be a building process. There's a whole series of them coming. And uh, I see that kind of building on the horizon here. We've got, of course, NAB, well, we've got Cinegear coming up on September 23rd uh, here in Los Angeles, but it's not at Paramount. It's going to be, it's going to be at the convention center. Oh my word, what a punch in the gut. I mean, that's been that show. You go to Paramount, you walk the lot, you go and stand in the bathroom. I remember standing in the bathroom and some guy goes, I'm using the urinal that John Wayne used. I mean, I don't know how he knew that actually, but, uh, but we were on the lot. We were at the place where all of those stars made the movies throughout so many years. 
It's just a cool place. If you're going to have a cinema uh, trade show, that was the place. But I don't know if they just couldn't secure the lot because of scheduling or uh, I don't know what the reason was. But it's at the LA Convention Center, which is going to be a much different vibe uh, this year. But it's going to happen, and that's probably the most important thing. Maybe it'll get back on the lot next year. I'm not sure. That happens on uh, September 23rd to the 26th. Then, of course, Photo Plus is scheduled for September 30th, but uh, 30th to the October 2nd. You know, the problem with Photo Plus is that it's gone from this really huge show with all kinds of education and even joined with WPPI at one point. So you had great education, great trade show, and they got rid of all the education, and now it's just a trade show. But, of course, all that education moved to the floor of the trade show, which made it much cheaper for people to be able to get access to to different shooters that do great work. They're in the Canon booth, they're in the Tamron booth, they're in all the different booths. So it just gave you access to great speakers that you didn't have to pay extra money for. But the education level wasn't as high as what you had in the past. So I think that was that's, that's hurt that show, but I think they're just responding to what can they do to keep that show alive. So that's Photo Plush in September. I love going to New York in the fall. Back on the East Coast, there's nothing more amazing than the East Coast. Of course, we have NAB October 9th through 13th. I predict that NAB will have a strong showing, international showing, I hope, but of course there are still you know, restrictions, flight problems, getting people there is going to be a problem. So it's, it remains to be seen how strong that will be, but I think that market wants to be together. I think there's a reason to bring them together to see the different uh, innovations. Man, if there was a year to have conventions, it would have been this last year in the camera world. It was a, 2020 was a year for cameras like never seen before. Uh, so many releases and incredible cameras that just leaped forward and gave you uh, great specs and great um, entrance into the market, and yet we had no no hands-on experience with them. There's something great about the hands-on experience being there in person. There really is something great about that hands-on experience being there in person. You know, I walked over to Canon Booth and I said, show me all, this is at uh, WPPI just a couple weeks ago, I show me all of your EOS cameras. I want to look at the two. I want to look at the 200, the 300, the 500. I want to look at all of these, and then I want to look, look at which one matches with which camera. And they got them all out for me, and I played with all of them, and I was just trying to decide what what makes the most sense right now. And there's just something about that experience you cannot you can't read specs and figure it out. You just can't. Also with education, it's just an opportunity to hear people talk about their work and talk about their process. If you're afraid of trade shows, if you're afraid of clubs and you're afraid of coming together and that kind of thing because you're going, I don't know enough or I feel intimidated, don't let that intimidate you. It is a place to learn and grow. Uh, you know, photographers sometimes hunker down and hide themselves and go, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk to other people about my work. Like somehow we have a secret that no one's figured out. Yeah, it's called F11. No one knows about F11. I can't meet with anybody because they might find out I use F11. It's ridiculous. Get out there and talk to other photographers. Share, the, share your knowledge, gain from their knowledge. It'd be a great way to grow. So, and that's, conventions are a great place to do that. I learn a lot at conventions. I love going to conventions. I love sitting and listening to other people talk about their work. I think it's a great educational experience. Anything new with Tamron? That's a great question. I think the biggest news from Tamron is their 18 to 300, 3.5, 6.3 lenses coming out. This is an incredible, this is a, a first 16.6 .6 all-in-one zoom lens for APS-C, Sony. And these, this is one of the series that is going to come out eventually in Fuji as well. But that 18 to 300 is an equivalent of 27 to 450. Think about that on an APS-C uh, sensor, uh, 27 to 450. That's a great range. It's a 3563, which gives you really a pretty amazing range from a wider telephoto to uh, a wider lens to a stronger telephoto. So it's, it has all the things that, uh, that, not, that Tamron has done in the past. Comes in at a great price, about $700, just under $699. It's got their great autofocus drive. It's got just the incredible focusing distance. That's the thing about this whole series of lenses for Sony and now for Fuji, is that they have an incredible focusing distance. This lens focuses so close that you're about a half an inch away from the subject matter when you focus on the wide end. So you're getting uh, a really a mag mag magnification ratio of 1.2. So that means it's, that things are about half of their reality size when you focus in on them. And that's, that's pretty amazing. That that's, is not a macro lens, 
but it's certainly getting there and it's giving you that capability in a zoom which is pretty amazing any RF news from Tamron? None whatsoever. No RF lens news from Tamron. They seem to now be heading down the Fuji path. I don't have any insight whatsoever as far as what direction or what they're doing. Uh, that's way above my pay grade. Um, I'm, not a, a, I'm not a Tamron uh, employee at all. Uh, they certainly sponsor us here at the uh, Slant and Lens, but so far I have not heard any news whatsoever. Um, my feeling about it? is that there's a huge market there that really needs to be catered to and we need uh, we need RF lenses from Tamron we truly do and if they're going to continue because well what did we talk about a minute ago DSLRs are dead mirrorless is a direction so sales for those DSLR uh, lenses for Canon and for Nikon are going to slowly drop off for Tamron and if they're going to really move forward and invest in the market they're going to need to start you know, releasing uh, RF lenses that just has to be the next step. We need a Trinity, RF Trinity, as soon as possible. I mean, that would be the next step. And, and this kind of, uh, like they've done with Sony, would be incredible. These small, compact, 67 millimeter uh, lenses that are just so easy to carry with you and give you a small, compact footprint to carry around with that R or with that mirrorless uh, format. It makes so much sense if you're traveling, if you're shooting weddings, you got to haul them around all day. They just make so much sense in that kind of really small, compact uh, market. What about Pentax? What about Pentax? Pentax has been pretty quiet. We had the G, uh, uh, no, that's Pentax. Pentax, no, Pentax, sorry. Pentax, I think we'll see some things from them this year. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they have coming out. I wish I had better information but I really don't. Uh, that's a camera I'm going to look into. Thank you for that. That gives me a little nudge to figure out what's going on with Pentex. So we'll see what's coming up next. Any other questions there, Jalene? Um. You know, leave us a comment below. Let us know if this time works uh, at 8 a.m. live show on Tuesdays. Uh, we'll probably do this once a month just to kick off the uh, month. Uh, give us a little perspective about what's going on out there in the camera world and answer all your questions. But leave some comments below. We'd love to hear from you on what works for you. I know it's closer to noon on the uh, East Coast, and it's uh, certainly early here on the West Coast. But uh, just let us know what works for you. Anything you have else, Julian? All right, so there you have it. There's the news for the day. The Everything from Sony to Canon to everything in between. So I hope you found this interesting, give you some great information to start your day so you keep those cameras rolling and keep on clicking. Make sure you subscribe.